Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will talk about the importance of protecting marine life and marine ecosystems with special guests. Sarah Oktai, Executive Director of the Center for Coastal Studies in Massachusetts, and Peter Chang, CEO of the Pacific Marine Mammal Center in California. So, Sarah, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. It's just great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for having us, Mark. And, and uh, I'm going to set you up. I'm going to go over to your, you, Peter. We're having a, a time in this, in this country where uh, people are divided and sometimes we're not talking to each other. We really want to try and, and um, share uh, more in the country and bring the country together. So I wanted to set this up with uh, observing the Population Center of America is in Hartville, Missouri. The geographic center is just north of Bell Forge in South Dakota. And, and so going over to you, Peter, why should folks in Hartville and Bell Forge, inland states, care about the health of marine ecosystems? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Mark. Um, you know, our oceans are the most important natural resource on this planet. And we have to understand that there is a ebb and flow with what we do inland um, that affects our ocean waters. And, and, and I'll just talk to a couple of big things that we're worried about with our ocean waters today that are a result from uh, inland activities. And, and one is a continued, continued issue with carbon emissions that is resulting in the warming of the waters. And, and for us as a marine mammal hospital, the way that it impacts us is that when the waters are warmed up, the cold water fish that the marine mammals prey on they are going further offshore, further below water. And what happens is the marine mammals, and especially the young pups, as well as the moms that are going to look for food, they are having um, a tougher time spending more days out there and also just not able to do it because the young pups don't have the lung capacity or skill set. So they're literally coming on the beach, starving skin and bones because of uh, what we're doing inland. And then another effect that we're seeing inland is that, um, you know, the, the fertilizer that we're using, um, uh, in addition to what we've done in, in uh, years past, you know, there was a, there was a, well, there was a widely used pesticide that was um, called DDT that was used in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. When that was banned, as well as the fertilizer that's coming, that's running off into the ocean, but the pesticides, when that was banned, that all went into the Southern California uh, waters because it was at one point legal to do it there. And what we're now finding is that that DDT is causing immune systems of these marine mammals to be weakened, resulting in a, a cancer as affecting our marine mammals. So those are just two of the issues. What you're saying is that, is that 50 years ago, and we, we saw this as well with, for example, lead and bald eagles, uh, over half the bald eagles uh, now have lead poisoning. We see these substances from 50 years ago uh, becoming forever problems, and uh, they're not something that can be buried. They're not something that can somehow be taken out. We're seeing this with, with microplastics, aren't we, where plastics break down, break down, break down, and then they end up in the food chain. So that means that uh, that fish that we eat, we're, we're eating plastic, aren't we, Sarah? We, we absolutely are. And we have a large microplastics department here at the Center for Coastal Studies. And not only does this impact um, marine mammals and um, whales and fish that we study, but it's in our systems and in our bodies and our kids' bodies. It's completely spread out throughout the environment and it's in the water column. So it gets, you know, picked up by phytoplankton and zooplankton and biomagnified up into um, the fish species that we eat, whether we're eating tuna or uh, other fish. And, and we have the same problem that Peter brought up where a lot of the fish are moving offshore and closer to the deeper parts of the Atlantic. And so these whales and seals and uh, dolphins are chasing that food further into other fishing areas. So we're having to manage new fishing areas as these whales search out further areas for their food. And this is happening up and down the, the food chain. So to, to draw an analogy, is your point basically that the ocean is like the water of, of the earth? If, if the earth is, is the body, the ocean is the water. 
of the of the earth, the rivers, the water of the earth. It's almost as if you're saying that we can no more separate what goes on in the water of the of the body of the earth than we can with what goes on in the in our own bodies, right? We can't basically say that the the water that is in our bodies is somehow treated differently. You're saying it's all interconnected. It goes back to our, I don't know, third grade classes where we saw the rain clouds and the, the drops of water falling on the mountains, which became rivers and then go, go into the ocean. You're saying that that's really the entire uh, cycle there, right? Absolutely. And as a chemical oceanographer, I've spent my PhD and many years of research actually tracking water that's landed in, in the Mississippi River all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and, and gets out into our systems. So we are all connected. Um, the oceans are drawing down a lot of the carbon dioxide that we're putting up into the atmosphere. They're acting as a really amazing uh, infiltration system. Otherwise, we'd be much harder, but they can't do it forever. So everything we do is getting transported into the atmosphere and transported into the ocean and affecting marine life that uh, wasn't doing anything wrong, but just existing. It's interesting that you say you're a chemical oceanographer. So talk a little bit about the discipline, because I remember about 30 years ago, um, there was a big issue of uh, uh, acidification um, in which um, pollutants coming off of land and uh, airborne pollutants from uh, from coal fire plants and so on and so forth were dropping and then creating, uh, I guess, sulfuric and, and uh, hydrochloric acid, which incre- increased the um, it decreased the pH, some acidified uh, uh, water bodies. Talk a little bit more about your discipline and exactly what you're studying and where the largest impacts are beyond plastics. Sure. And you're talking about acid rain, which was from all of these constituents. And even now, our bigger problem is carbon dioxide getting dissolved into ocean water is forming carbonic acid. So we're acidifying the oceans and we have to a great extent making shellfish have to work harder to just build their homes. But as a chemical oceanographer, I've traced uh, the signature from the World Trade Center and the Hudson River and Hudson Bay into the sediments. We typically look at anthropogenic um, impacts, things that human beings- use smaller words. Uh, Yep, I'm defining it. So man-made elements uh, that get into, and I can track that all over the world, um, whether it's from nuclear power plants or from coal plants or just from the use of different things like DDT that Peter brought up. Our impact, humans have impacted everything from the Arctic to the Antarctic, and we can trace that. So a chemical oceanographer studies everything around these large creatures. We're looking at water and what's in the water and how that's impacting it. And it's fascinating, but it, it can be a little you know, sad, too, when we see how much our, our influence has gone. It used to be that when we extracted fish from the, wa- from the, uh, from the waters, we weren't actually damaging the waters in that process. Uh, now it's becoming very, very obvious that we need the, uh, the life of the ocean uh, to, to feed us, but also to help to recycle air, to generate power and so on. Um, How can we ameliorate the damage that we do through our everyday lives? And I'm talking about individuals. I'm not talking about governments. Government programs are kind of, they're out of our hands unless we're in government. But what can I do, Peter, in order to uh, have a real impact? If you were going to make one recommendation of how I should change my behavior, what would that be? Well, I, I, I just want to take a step back. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mark. I just want to take a step back and really talk about education and awareness. Uh, I think that's that's critical in uh, really in, ensuring that uh, the appropriate change takes place. Um, and because a lot of people don't really understand, kind of, you know, we we talk about marine open o, uh, ecosystems and ocean ecosystems, but but we are all connected inland and on the ocean. And we have to really understand that the impacts that we're doing are, are reverberating up to um, the, the greatest places. So I think education and, and especially the, the leaders of tomorrow, the, the, the conservationists and biologists, the youth, we need to really hit those people because those are the change makers that are, that are going to um, be able to, to really move the needle on, on these issues. Same question to you, Sarah. What is the thing that I should do? Um, is it to do what what Peter said? You know, talk with talk with those change makers, or my change maker. 
Well, I think each person can be a change maker and education is key, being informed. Um, fortunately, I'm really encouraged by kids and working with kids. I gave a lot of uh, Skype talks to kids around the country and they really get it. They want to know about sharks. They want to know about whales. They intrinsically feel this responsibility for all living creatures, which uh, I think we lose as we get older. But as, as far as an individual person, we make decisions every day, whether it's what car we drive, what food we eat, how high up on the food chain do we eat, who we elect to office, and how we live our lives all reflects upon the entire planet. And all of us uh, can live in more sustainable manners. Um, and once again, kids often lead the way, whether it's something as simple as not using a single use water bottle or a plastic bag. I mean, we have so much unnecessary trash that we're just throwing into the world. Yeah, but so it, it's, it, it is the plastics issue. I just had some smoked salmon the other day. It was nicely sliced, small um, smoked, smoked salmon on some cardboard wrapped in more plastic than that then there was salmon, right? So I'm thinking here and I'm thinking, I'm eating this fish that probably contains microplastics. It's, and I'm it's, going not, to it's away. not probably, Mark. It's not probably, Mark. It's 100%. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm assuming, it's so, so really what I should do is try and get some fish that is raised without microplastics and then cut off a slice of plastics and just, just chew on the plastic. Right. So so I'm uh, now I threw away the plastic. OK, I did not keep it and hang it up on my wall as an art piece. So I was part of that problem. But I'm, I'm thinking about it in ways that I never thought about it before. And in part prompted by uh, some of what I see uh, on TV, uh, we just asked a poll question in which uh, we asked how people learned about this, this uh, these issues. And the the uh, most popular answer were documentaries and that type of, of education. Uh, Sarah, what form does education uh, take in your organization? And then uh, Peter, could you talk a little bit about the form of education that, that you provide? Sarah? Yeah, thanks so much for asking. We are actually featured in a new documentary that's just now coming out on the film festival circuit called The Last of the Right Well, and it features our scientists and our disentanglement team. Documentaries affect a lot of people around the country. We also work with social media, with Twitter, with podcasts, um, with a large megaphone on the edge of the, you know, down on the street. We're located in a tourist area, so we're trying to help tourists actually understand a little bit more about the ocean. It's kind of ironic when you go to Cape Cod and you're enjoying the beach, often you don't understand that you are looking at one of the last great wild places and you've got these 356 individual right whales, you know, right in front of you that are the last of their species. So you're, you know, able to actually interact with that. So I spent the a great lot. great white whale was, was really, it's from Moby Dick, right? The, uh, right. Oh, oh, yeah. And I'm saying right. Well, the, the R I G H T. Yes. Like oh, okay. right and left. Um, but uh, we I haven't seen a white whale here, but that would be that would be interesting. But, you know, they're looking at endangered creatures and uh, interacting with them. And so a lot of times um, we spend as much time as we can educating. I feel that's a really important responsibility of all scientists is to talk about our work. So you're taking uh, people out, you're working with volunteers, you're creating documentaries. Peter, what are you doing to uh, to get your messages out? Yeah, I think um, w one of the great things that uh, we, we understand here at Pacific Marine Mammal Center is that we have a platform. And, and w luckily, we have some amazing researchers around us that focus specifically on water quality. But what they're telling us is that they can churn out study after study and continue to tell people that the water is bad, but they won't get traction because it's not really resonating with the individual. We have these marine mammals that we work with, and when they can see the effect that it's having on these precious marine life with these beautiful eyes and these personalities, that's where, that's where you can start engaging with both adults and children. So we, we do a lot of education here. One of our co-founders was a longtime science teacher and, and he really embedded education in the fabric of this organization. We do a lot of on-site programs here with, with children, uh, many of which are in the underserved communities. But we also do um, a number of programs across the country. We're in uh, 12 different children's hospitals um, where we beam in live interactive programs. We have programs with um, uh, military vets that have PTSD. 
um, and, and do a number of programs with foster children. And really, again, understanding that we have the platform of these animals that we can use as a backdrop to really um, send these strong, important messages to these people. You know, one of the things that I'm really interested in, I'd just be fascinated, Sarah, about your view on, on this and, and Peter um, also on yours. In, in this field, in marine sciences, it's a male-dominated field. I think that's safe to say. Um, it's also dominated by people who are white. And Sarah, you're of uh, Turkish descent. Uh, Peter, I don't know uh, uh, what descent you are, but you're not white. Um, you both had to deal with, in your careers, this, this shift. And you're part of the vanguard of that shift. So, Sarah, um, if you could just talk a little bit about, about what you encounter and the kinds of changes to ensure that that we have representation, everybody feels included, but it's not just a feeling, it's also about if everybody's included, then everybody has a stake. As soon as people are excluded, as soon as, as, soon as voices are not heard, you, you diminish that stake and we can't solve the problem anymore. So uh, Sarah, how, how have you experienced this, this topic of, of inclusivity and and um, and yourself being as a scientist in the vanguard of uh, of these types of, of transformations, I'm assuming. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I just finished writing a couple of book chapters on women in the wild doing field research, which is coming <laughs> out. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of women that are in field sciences and field biologies, but each of us had to fight to get here. Uh, the first thing I did as a new executive director here at the Center of Coastal Studies is talk to my staff and have them form a, a diversity, uh, equity, inclusion and justice committee so that we could start changing our hiring practices, advertise our jobs to uh, historically back colleges and universities, to minority serving institutions, to start making opportunities now. We also have the ability to, since we're located in Provincetown, Massachusetts, this is a very gay friendly community, which I love. So we're starting with uh, LGBTQI um, initiatives so that all people feel safe and feel included and part of the part of the answer and the solution. But we have to make these opportunities uh, actively available and make sure that we're reaching out to to all communities uh, so that everyone feels welcome. But it's an ongoing thing. And fortunately, nationally, a lot of groups like the National Association of Marine Labs and the Organization of Biological Field Stations are joining in these efforts and making this job one to have everyone at the scientific table. Peter, what has your experience been? Yeah, it, 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 um, it, it has been exactly as you mentioned, Mark. We are trying to change that narrative um, with, uh, you know, some of the programs Sarah talked about with our DEI initiatives. And, and uh, I will tell you, you know, we, we are just early on in that, um, but we are making an effort uh, at, at the highest priority of the organization. Um, in addition to that, I think, we, you know, I think we can layer on kind of our education programs to really inspire that next generation. You know, we have a big focus in, in girls and in marine science That'll hopefully kind of change some of those statistics that, that you talked about. So I think I think you know just understanding that there's an issue and, and is is a big deal. But you know I, I really am encouraged by kind of the steps that we see at organizations like Sarah and Pacific Marine Mammal Center. I also think that your organizations serve another purpose in addition to engaging people all across the political spectrum, the ideological spectrum. Um, race, religion, you know, uh, politics and so on. You're also uh, bringing people together in a common cause because it affects everybody. Right. I mean, it doesn't affect yeah. me any different than you do, than it affects you, uh, Sarah, because I'm a man and you're a woman. Right. It doesn't affect you any different, Peter, because you happen to be on a different coast or, or you're in a different ethnicity than, than, than us two. We're all human beings, right? So if we're going to solve things together, we get to also talk about who we are while we're doing it, just because we're working together. It, in a sense, you're, you're not only benefiting from um, inclusion, but you're also putting out this, this platform for just common cause. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I, th I think um, if I can just add to that, you know, in the last two years, um, as we continue to work through the pandemic, it was just so much more pronounced in that, you know, with with um, such a such 
I guess, um, with, with people taking sides on different things, it's, it was just such a refreshing environment um, to be at the center where, you know, whether you're a Republican or, or um, Democrat or one believe in one religion or the other, or one def- uh, different socioeconomic um, demographic, that, you know, organizations like us have a way of galvanizing the community. And uh, it, it was really special, especially during the last couple of years. You know, there's another there's another really uh, important issue here, and that is how do you uh, use science and and create credibility for science in one area by learning science in another area? Sarah, um, how do you take let's say I don't necessarily believe in certain elements of the scientific method. Right. I might not even believe in in evolution the way scientists said. I might feel from a faith basis that I see um, uh, people and animals evolving from some different um, different sense. How do you, without disrespecting my beliefs, but having beliefs of your own, how do you bridge that that gap? How do you help me? who have a different set of beliefs, a different, but I have an interest. If I'm going fishing, I don't want to be eating plastic, right? I have an interest in, in, in God's creatures. How do you help me to understand your world and, and you learn a little bit of, uh, about mine? That's a great question. And I'm uh, from Oklahoma, so I have um, brothers in Oklahoma. Uh, Unfortunately, they both believe in climate change, but they're obviously more conservative than I am. One of the first things we do in uh, hearkening back to what Peter was saying earlier is finding common ground. All of us want to have healthy kids. All of us want to be healthier ourselves. All of us have a responsibility to how we take care of the environment around us. So usually I bring it back to human health. A lot of the research we do with things like hump back whales, for instance, gives us answers on um, cancer causing agents for humans. So even though we're looking at an animal maybe far removed from them, what we're learning from that animal can help us understand our own health. Um, lobsters have the ability to almost be immortal. They live much longer because of how their cells divide. So I, I talk to, I just try to find something that's common. We all want to be happy, healthy. We want to be able to eat things that aren't polluted. Every American feels that way. Every American has a, has a feeling of responsibility for taking care of their home and their kids and their community. So typically, if you bring it back to the community and the fact that both you and Peter have worded really well, we're all in this together. We're all sharing this planet uh, and we have to take care of each other. So when you tend to go back to things like nurturing and caring and responsibility, I think everyone gets onto the same page. Peter, do you do you feel the same way? I, I do. I absolutely do. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll just kind of talk to that, that we have a platform. And, and it's because we are very fortunate to be working with these precious marine mammals up close. Um, uh, we have a visitor center that that uh, we get about 50,000 visitors uh, a year. And we're lucky to be able to show people, you know, some people are skeptical and and believing in climate change, but when they see these animals that are literally skin and bones because of what we're doing um, inland and and what's happening to the climate, then that's starting to trigger, trigger some discussion in their mind. And it also can can link back to what you see, the concept of America. America, to me, has always included wild spaces, wild things, right? It's not a just a cultivated place. It's it's a place also um, of, of amazing beauty. I would not want to, I don't care where I live, I would not want to diminish wild America any more than it already is. I, I, and I think that, uh, that people who are hunters, people who are hikers, um, you can end up with all sorts of different politics and still enjoy um, that wild part and, and not want to see it diminish. So you're, you're talking, Peter, about a common, I don't care if you're, if you're an urban a uh, person living in the middle of a city. You want to at least have this idea of, of, of a wild place, don't you? No, a- absolutely. We talk a lot about coexisting with, with uh, all aspects of nature. 
And uh, so it, it's it's uh, just kind of doing what we do and, and, and also allowing our precious coast, uh, our precious coastline to be vibrant and alive. Um, and so we, we absolutely uh, encourage encourage that. So we asked a question. We asked, um, what kind of investment are you willing to make to improve the health of marine ecosystems? And um, we had 88% of the people who responded say up to 5% of what I earn, which is, which is very high. And, and there were even a few people who said that up to 20% of what I earn. Let me ask you uh, a question about how we started. We started with the idea of plastics and microplastics. Um, could you each talk a little bit about the problem the way you see it and what we as a society ought to do, if we're going to invest in something that is going to clean up specifically the ocean, plastic seems to be a great place to start. And there's this whole junkyard in the middle of, of uh, the Pacific, isn't there, um, of, of just discarded plastic. Um, what do we do to fix that, Sarah? And then, Peter, if you could give, give us your, your answer. We're coming to the end of our time, so we're going to give you the last word. Sarah, what do we do? Thanks for asking. Um, yes, the first thing we can do is just use less of it. it. It's kind of ironic that, you know, we've spent the last 50, 60, 70 years trying to develop all these man-made uh, devices and, and materials, and they've come to run our lives. So just using less of this material, choosing natural material, we don't need almost any of this. We don't need uh, plastic wraps. We don't need uh, that that. Package that, that that my salmon came in the other day. Um, we don't need also, uh, you know, if we're going to get a bottle, let's not get a plastic bottle. Let's get a, a glass bottle. Correct. Yeah. And a lot of towns along the Cape and islands have been banning single use plastic. I think Nantucket banned uh, single use plastic bags and styrofoams 20 years ago. So it didn't kill the economy. So often it helps to remind people that we can use less of this material and treat the earth better, lower our carbon footprint and still have a healthy, vibrant economy. And I think it's important to talk to people about that and to show them data that that shows that they are, they can still make a living without some of these materials. And it's important. Uh, we'll be spending billions cleaning up this material and eating it and worrying about health impacts. So most of the time, reducing our, our pollution uh, ends up actually being cost effective. And it's helping. I think it helps to remind people that this is not only good for the planet, but good for your pocketbook. So, Peter, is there is there also a role for actually collecting the trash? I mean, I, I feel in a way that, you know, when I've seen some of these pictures, it's almost like we've decided to take our, our dustbins, our trash cans, and just sort of throw them out in the street and then go inside and say, well, my house is clean. Is, is there a role for us to go out and actually pick up after ourselves? Um, I, I think yes. I think the, the enormity of the issue that we're dealing with uh, plastic pollution is that um, there's, there's not one silver bullet. And it's going to take a number of different solutions. And that includes what we're doing at the individual basis at the grassroots level. I also do want to um, uh, hit on, you know, what, what we also need to do is also pay attention to what's going on at, at local and state and federal policy. I think those are really game changing um, uh, actions that can take place. For instance, in California, there's a bill right now that will uh, limit the amount of plastic packaging that manufacturers will be able to use. And that's something that we're, we're um, very strongly um, fighting for is, is to do that. And, and those broad sweeping changes can, along with what we're doing at the individual level, is going to be what it's going to take to, to really um, change, change what's going on. The thing that, that strikes me is the plastics were invented in 1860s. Um, so we've had about 150 years of, of plastic pollution because every single piece of plastic ends up that we've ever created has ended up on the land or in water or burnt in, and, and made it into air. It's all still there. So the, the real question is how long and how much are we going to spend in reducing that? How long is it going to take? How much are we going to spend? And and um, and whether we have the will uh, or do we do we uh, do what we did when I was a kid, which is if you were driving along a highway and you had some trash, you just threw it out the window because you didn't want to have a messy car. 
until we stop doing that. So uh, really, thank you so much, Sarah Oktai, Executive Director of the Center for Coastal Studies in Massachusetts. We just scratched the surface. We have such a great operation, such a large operation, and we're so appreciative that you um, that you're sharing the work that you do. And Peter Chang, CEO of the uh, Pacific Marine Mammal Center in California. Thank your staffs. Thank your boards. Thank your funders. Thank your volunteers. How many volunteers do you have, Sarah? Oh, we've got 400 for marine debris alone, but probably close to a thousand. And Peter? We have 200 active volunteers that dedicate at least one shift a week, anywhere from four to 14 hours. People doing God's work and helping us all. Thank you so much. Everyone stay safe. Attendees, thank you so much for your help and for your questions. And we'll see you on Thursday where we're going to be talking about representation in the arts, a really interesting, interesting show. Thanks so much. Everyone stay safe.